Now, Filippo Olivieri uh, is going to talk about Dr. Mabuse number two, an investigation into Kubrick's mythological image. And um, actually, uh, his, the title of his talk uh, comes from a German article uh, by the popular magazine Der Spiegel and Zweiter Dr. Mabuse. That's Dr. Mabuse number two. Um, and uh, Filippo Olivieri will talk about this in a second and he will also be here tonight for us um, talking a little bit more in the Q&A section afterwards about his uh, famous book uh, Stanley Kubrick and me 30 years at his side which he authored together with Emilio Alessandro Stanley Kubrick's driver for 30 years. We'll come back to this in a minute. Stanley Kubrick, says Filippo Olivieri, is characterized by a peculiar image, a perfectionist, a tyrannical boss for his cast and crew, an obsessive genius, a cryptic auteur, a control freak, a misanthropic recluse who rarely conceded interviews. But despite many recent positive accounts from members of his family and close collaborator, collaborators, sorry, this Kubrick mythology is still pervasive and believed. But how did such an image come to light and why? More intriguingly, did Kubrick play any role in its origin and evolution? So we're now uh, going to hear something about the image and of course, and I have to mention this um, right here before the talk already, we will have an additional screening closing our first day of the symposium weekend right afterwards at six here in the cinema with a film dealing with the image of Stanley Kubrick um, and that will be Brian Cook's Color Me Kubrick. Filippo Olivieri is an independent scholar and writer and he is one of the leading experts in Kubrick cinema in Italy. He has written extensively on the director's career for international newspapers and magazines and he is, as already mentioned, the author of the biography of Emilio D'Alessandro Stanley Kubrick and me, 30 years at his side. The English edition was published in 2017, sorry, 16, already in um, New York by Arcade Publishing. And we also have some books here at the museum's bookshop and Filippo um, uh, will also sign you copies if you request that. And um, Filippo, last but not least, also um, co uh, worked as a co-scenarist for the documentary S is for Stanley by Alex Infascheli uh, in 2015. And I'm very pleased and very honored to have him here tonight. So please join me in welcoming Filippo Olivieri. Thank you. And again, apologies for the little delay, which can only be attributed to human error, as we all know. <laughs> And um, I, I would like to start by uh, thanking Niels and all the organizers for having me at this uh, symposium and inviting me at this conference, and also you for attending my talk. And um, as Niels said, this is about Kubrick's mythological image, and uh, the title comes from an interview that Kubrick gave to, for the Spiegel in which he spoke about his reputation and he said that he was often portrayed as he was a sort of mad scientist sitting in the dark, surrounded by computers and machines, um, controlling the earth, Dr. Mabuse number two. Well, there might be some resemblance and in fact, the common view of Kubrick is uh, indeed peculiar, a master technician, a mindless perfectionist, a tyrannical boss for his cast and crew, a man progressively alienated from the world, never seen in public, more or less a misanthrope. Kubrick's self-deprecating joke about Dr. Mabuse was quite appropriate. The first thing I did for my examination of Kubrick's public image was to gather all the ways in which he was described in the media. I came across words like legendary, secretive, mysterious, an enigma. He was bohemian and unkempt, but also meticulous, difficult, mean, even an enslaver. He had a great attention to detail. He was a control freak, or rather a paranoid. Once a boy wonder, he had become a star, a phenomenon of mythic proportions, in fact, a god. We are also familiar with a series of anecdotes that are part of the director's backstory. He had a movie theater repainted. He did not allow his driver to go faster than 30 miles an hour. He never went on holiday. He kept people on the telephone for at least two hours, preferably at night. 
He did a hundred takes for every scene. He never took an airplane. He never spoke to the press. There are, of course, many other descriptions which I try to organize here. And all these beliefs collectively taken are the Kubrick mythology, a set of characteristics that have been mechanically repeated without being necessarily substantiated and became, in effect, myths describing Kubrick's physical appearance, his personality, his behavior during the making of his films, his attitude towards the world. This mythology is so well established that you can't avoid it when talking or writing about Kubrick, even informally or academically. You either conform to it or you reject it, but you can't ignore it. The discourse over Kubrick was and still is influenced by these myths. Take, for example, the documentary Stanley Kubrick, A Life in Pictures, which is the equivalent of an authorized biography since it was directed by Kubrick's brother-in-law and long-lasting executive producer, Jan Harlan. Let's watch how the film begins. We have to do a small... It was magnificent. One of his pictures are equivalent to 10 of somebody else's. Oh, Nicole. And shake his head. Do you know him? And nobody ever really knew him. He was known as a, uh, a kind of future threat. One of the all-time great motion picture makers. A future threat to peace and quiet. Legendary meanness. There were times he drove me crazy. He was a very lovable individual. I love him one minute, and the next minute I hate him. I could kill him. Perhaps the most intelligent person I've ever met. He got fascinated with Nescafe commercials. Have you seen the film Groundhog Day? Because they told stories so fast. Well, that's what it was like. This man was born to push the envelope. There is still a part of Stanley that's a great mystery to me, and he always pushed the envelope. And you must expect someone like that to be different from the rest of us. I think we were too scared of him over here. Everybody pretty much acknowledges he's the man. And uh, I still feel that underrates him. <laughs> you see that this film is clearly... Oops. Um, clearly a response to the mythology. Okay. And um, as Jan Allen said, the main reason I wanted to make this film was to impress upon people that Stanley was not a lunatic. Since Kubrick died, the new literature, interviews, books and documentaries has been often marked by the same purpose, that is, that is to try and find the real Stanley Kubrick, in quotes, the man behind the myth. But nobody cared to investigate the myths, who originated the Kubrick mythology, when and where its building blocks were first introduced. Why is it still so successful? This has simply, has simply gone unquestioned. We all accepted what was Kubrick's own explanation. The myths are the result of his media shyness and the laziness of the reporters. In other words, since Kubrick never speak, spoke to the press and kept his actions undisclosed, journalists have had to invent stories that they could then supply to their readers. According to this view, many of the myths presented therefore an inaccurate depiction of the real Kubrick, and he, he in fact complained extensively about them. Since the early 70s, he began dismissing the stories that were circulating about him as your usual Kubrick anecdotes. In 1975, he described himself as a demented perfectionist according to the publicity mythology around me. But it was in 1987, during the promotional interviews for Full Metal Jacket, that he properly addressed the matter. 
Part of my problem is that I cannot dispel the myths that have somehow accumulated over the years, he admitted regretfully. These stories get more elaborate as they are repeated in the papers, so that the general picture is that I'm a recluse surrounded by high walls and computers who wears a football helmet while driving at 30 miles an hour and has a helicopter spray his garden. He concluded, practically everything I read about me is grotesquely wrong. The mythology appears as something external that originated independently from Kubrick and that thrived regardless of his true nature and his effort to stop it. However, a number of the myths are undeniably true. By all means, he was a perfectionist, even if he didn't like the word. He did many takes until he got what he wanted. He shot for longer and longer periods of time and so on. And he was also obsessive, a word he didn't object to because he himself used it to describe how absorbed he needed to be about a subject to sustain the years of work that were necessary for him to make a film. You must be obsessed, that's how he put it. Kubrick was not suggesting he was obsessed in a medical sense, of course, even if um, the press often exploited this implication. Indeed, many labels show a negative take on what is otherwise a neutral or positive quality in order to increase media resonance. As explained by Kubrick's daughter, Anya, Certain themes are a journalistic exaggeration of his characteristics. Recluse is a word that gets thrown at him in every article, and as far as I can work out, recluse must be defined as someone who doesn't talk to journalists. In the same vein, megalomania can be seen as the media embroidery of self-confidence, and tyrannical is a shawy slant on a director doing his job. Christiana Kubrick gave two examples to illustrate how a myth was created through misrepresentation or exaggeration of trivial anecdotes. Once he hurt his back and couldn't move, so he drove at 30 miles an hour because he should have been in bed. Also, his parents live in New Jersey, where every window has a bug screen. So he arrives in England and says, aren't there any screens on the windows? The next thing you hear is he sprays his garden with a helicopter. If Kubrick complained that he couldn't dispel the myths, his family tried to do just that. These last two quotes are from a lengthy interview that Christiana and her daughters, Catherine and Anya, gave to Sight and Sound magazine with the explicit intent of adjusting the myth before it sets in concrete. After the director's death, the Kubricks radically changed their attitude with the media and began to challenge the mythology with an unprecedented determination. I retrieved 10 interviews that Christiana gave to European reporters in the summer of 1999 alone. Please take a moment to read how the titles were phrased, especially He Was No Monster and I'm Sick of All These Lies About My Husband. Christiana also opened a website where, I quote, she took the opportunity to confirm the truths about Stanley and correct the inaccuracies. Christiana's rationalization for the mythology dutifully mirrored that of Kubrick. It was an accumulation of made-up stories. It's the press cuttings. Everyone who's given a piece to write goes there and repeats the last thing written. In addition to sloppy journalism, Anya offered an alternative explanation when she said she believed the mythology originated from acrimony. Those who liked Kubrick and respected his wishes didn't speak to the press about him. So the stories that exist come from people who are, in some way, disaffected. Anya was referring specifically to Eyes Wide Open, a bitter memoir by Frederick Raphael, and to John Baxter's sens sensationalistic biography. But by considering the examples that the Kubricks gave in that interview, I believe they were commenting on something else too. The Invisible Man, because some of the stories they took issues with were in fact introduced first in this documentary that when it was broadcasted on British television in 1996 presented quite an unflattering image of Kubrick. Actor Marco McDowell introduced him in this way. Having dinner with him, he'll start eating stewed pears or something when you're just having the meat, you know, and you go, Stan. What do you, and he'll take a piece of pork, a piece of pear, or a piece of cream cake or something. Goes, Why are you, oh, it's just food. I mean, Napole this is how Napoleon ate. I went, uh-oh, uh-oh. Well, um, <clears throat> we don't have to call you Bonaparte, though, do we? <laughs> you know. 
The documentary featured extensively film historian David Thompson, who blatantly compared Kubrick to Jack Torrance, as if The Shining was a way for Kubrick to deal with his own retirement into, and I quote, a world of his own where he, where he tries to get rid of people and sort of goes crazy. According to Thompson, Kubrick's behavior on set was, another quote, not far from the madness of the character in The Shining. Thompson, who, it should be said, never visited the set, is a film critic, but is in, in this documentary he spoke very little about the films and ex instead expressed his own take on Kubrick's personality. I'm not sure he believes in people. I'm not sure he believes in personal relationships. I don't think he believes in women. Uh, I don't know that he believes in family. I don't think he believes in country. Uh, I can't think of other things he might believe in, but I don't think he believes in them. Barry Lyndon composer Leonard Rosenman reinforced the concept. He knows uh, more than anybody about the making of a film. And, uh, and uh, I don't know about uh, humanity, I don't know about what he knows about relationships between people and so on and so forth, because I haven't seen anybody with whom he had a real relationship. He just was either a kind of an enslaver in some way, or just totally insensitive. Recalling the hundreds of takes with the orchestra, Rosenman said he and the musicians looked at each other as if we were dealing with an insane person. The documentary ended on a montage of descriptions of Kubrick and then left the scene to McDowell for the closing remarks. Cold, linear, obsessed with microscopic detail. He's fixated, he's, he's diabolical, he's self-indulgent, he's, he's, a, he's a master. An intellectual. A magician. Genius. Genius dare shit. Genius? No. Michelangelo's a genius. John Ford is a genius, perhaps. Stanley, I, I think what stops him from being a genius, for me, is this lack of humanity. It's this withdrawing, this brilliant, yes. Extraordinary, yes. I mean, ever, ever, I mean one of the greats, yes, yes, all that. But I think at the bottom, at the end of the day, they say, well, what was he like as a man? What was he like as a human being? I think that's probably the test. He doesn't do well at, that's how the clip ended. I spoke with the director of this film, Paul Joyce, and he professed a genuine ad admiration for Kubrick as a filmmaker. So I asked him what was his idea about this film. I mean, think about uh, The Invisible Man. You know, uh, it's only when um, he, he gets covered by something. So I wanted, I wanted to cover Stanley with something so that we could see the shape. You know, but what's there? Maybe there's nothing there. Maybe it's all a, an emperor's new clothes, you know. Joyce sensed there was something bizarre in Kubrick's reputation and as, as an almighty filmmaker. And I think he also wanted to give a chance to those who had a contrarian view about Kubrick to express their feelings for the first time against the prevailing hagiography. Since the most memorable moments in the film come from people who, are, who were, as Anya said, disaffected, the lasting effect of The Invisible Man was, as Paul Joyce himself considered, that it opened the floodgate. It's only after the airing of this film, which was then the only existing documentary about Kubrick, that most of the stories about how crazy he was appeared and proliferated. Understandably, the Kubricks hated this film. And when Paul Joyce was about to make another documentary on Kubrick, they accepted to be interviewed in the vein of keeping the enemy closer. There was perhaps another reason for the Kubrick's family new course in media management. Right after Kubrick died, Christiana received a letter in which a couple accused Kubrick of seducing their son. Didn't Christiana know what her husband was really like? The couple asked. No wonder Christiana said that the lies about Kubrick made her sick. The seducer in question was obviously not Kubrick, but Alan Conway a man who impersonated Kubrick in the early 90s. Despite not looking or sounding at all like Kubrick, Conway successfully tricked a number of people and obtained access to clubs and theater shows, money and even sex. I'm going to play a short clip now to give you an idea of Conway's real look and demeanor. Nope. 
I have to minimize this, sorry. Uh, From the late 80s to the mid 90s, Alan Conway, a sometime travel agent and con man from Harrow, impersonated film director Stanley Kubrick. Alan Conway at that time was just uh, a person who was another Joe Bloggs, Joe Doe. I was just one of a million people living in London. But then I realized I didn't have to be. And I went on stage and played my role. I was in London and I wanted to see a show. It was um, a remake of Rose Tattoo. And Julie Waters was in it with Patricia Hayes. So I went to the box office. There were no seats at that time. And uh, I said, look, I don't want to throw my name around, but I'll tell you who I am. I'm Stanley Kubrick, and um, I'd very much like to see the show tonight. Have you got a single seat? Yes. We certainly have a single seat for you. Would you like to see them afterwards? I said, sure. So I saw the show, and then a man came just at the finish, took me to the uh, to their dressing room, and we chatted for a half an hour about what she's doing. She would like very much to work for me, because she knew a lot about my films. Oh, I'm sorry, his films. Alan Conway's trick proved so successful, of course, not for his powers of mimicry, but because in the 90s nobody really knew what Kubrick was like and above all it succeeded because of vanity. People wanted to believe that one of the planet's most secretive individuals had, fi had finally decided to reveal himself to them. Anthony Fruin... Oh, now it's working. Sorry. Okay. Anthony Fruin, one of Kubrick's assistants, began investigating the matter in 1991 and found out that Conway had a long criminal record. In the end, Conway was captured and since he was convinced to be possessed by the spirit of Stanley Kubrick, he was hospitalized and diagnosed with some form of schizophrenia. Conway's past included troubled relationships, alcoholism and family violence. It was a rather sad story of a distressed individual gradually losing contact with reality, but since we are here to study Kubrick's, uh, Kubrick's public image, we can't help but noting how Conway's apparition was, as Fruin said, an accident waiting to happen, a painfully ironic outcome for someone like Kubrick who played incognito while being world famous. Later today, today, you have a chance to see how this story was turned into a wild comedy, Color Me Kubrick, written by Tony Froome himself. In general, during the 90s, Kubrick's media coverage took a decidedly negative twist. With nothing new coming from Kubrick, the media exaggerated what they had to create a juicy story in a decade increasingly devoted to gossip and celebrity cult. Take, for example, the, this column from the English tabloid Punch, at the end of the long shooting of Eyes Wide Shut, it gave, it gave countless examples of Kubrick's eccentricity, or fake, and said, we are hearing stories that suggest Kubrick is even more insane than psychiatrists have led us to believe. There's a thin line between being an artistic perfectionist and a barking loon. Stanley has clearly crossed that line, and then some. In fact, it was Punch that had crossed the line, and Kubrick sued the magazine. And that was real news, because prior to this, Kubrick had only written a few letters to the editors and only to defend his films, most notably A Clockwork Orange, from the accusation of being a fascist film. Kubrick never cared to defend himself, but when Punch questioned his very sanity, when it implied he was clinically insane, he took the magazine to court for libel. I will go back to the mythology now and try to explain it. 
we saw that the classic view supported by Kubrick himself and his family is that it was mostly created by lazy reporters. We also saw that Kubrick complained about it. Surprisingly, it's almost as if the director, who was notoriously in charge of every minute aspect of his films, had not been able to control his image. But we did know that he in fact controlled his image. For example, it is said that he exerted a strong control even over the interviews that he conceded, by demanding approval before any text could be published. Kubrick's excruciating editing process has been described among many by a Washington Post reporter who dispatched 18 pages of transcript to Kubrick and received 28 pages of corrections. The same control was applied to the publications that sought his cooperation. The Kubrick Archive in London has a few drafts of books extensively amended by Kubrick, who clearly considered them as opportunities to promote his films and himself. The myth that Kubrick even controlled his interviews proved to be true. Yet another is not. Despite what has been repeatedly said, Kubrick did talk to journalists. I collected 350 reports containing original quotes by Kubrick given to international media over his 50 years of work, from brief press releases to lengthy interviews. For a director who only made 13 films, 350 media contacts certainly are not a small amount. The myth that Kubrick never gave interviews is simply not true. Also, the explanation that puts the origin of the mythology in Kubrick's media shyness can't be trusted either. Let's consider the distribution of these interviews over the years. We can see that naturally the peaks occur when a new film was released, but more interestingly, we can observe a sustained high number of contacts with media outlets until the release of 2001 A Space Odyssey. During the first 20 years of his career, Kubrick often initiated a contact with a journalist, for example, he telephoned to Hollywood columnists to supply them with information about the casting of an actor or a completion of a particular sequence. When he was shooting Pass of Glory, Spartacus, Lolita, Dr. Strangelove, and 2001, he also invited reporters to the studio, where, where they were given a guided tour of the sets, and in the case of Dr. Strangelove, were even handed pages from the screenplay. It's only when he relocated permanently in England that Kubik drastically cut down his contacts with the media. In the subsequent 25 years, he met reporters only when he had to promote a new film. The truth behind the myth that Kubrick never talked to the press is then that he talked to it, but on his own terms. He sought media exposure as long as he needed it, and once he had established himself as a relevant filmmaker, he selected agreeable reporters and then edited their articles to be sure they presented an image of himself that he liked. In short, Kubrick understood the value of promotion and tried to control it as much as he could. In any case, with an average of 20 interviews per film, even in the second part of his career, Kubrick can't really be defined as an, an inaccessible filmmaker. And the number of occasions in which he talked to the press can't support the aura of reclusiveness and of mystery that's usually associated with him. As a result, a different explanation for the origin of the mythology is to be found. I will now focus on a subset of these 350 articles, those that were written by a reporter after he or she had met with Kubrick in person. These first-hand non-derivative reports sometimes present colorful description of Kubrick, such as he looked like an undernourished Marlon Brando, or he has the bohemian look of a riverboat gambler or a Romanian poet, or even of an apprentice Mephistopheles. These are personal impressions, but also factual glimpses into how Kubrick appeared to the eyes of a journalist, and therefore they may help us understand how his image came to light and evolved. The first profile of, look of Kubrick was published in 1948 when he was wor working as a photo reporter for Look magazine. Presenting his assignment at Columbia University, the profile said that Kubrick pushed around the, the distinguished faculty members and officials because he knew exactly what he wanted. A veteran photographer at 19, Kubrick had such an intense preoccupation with his work that he tended to forget his keys and glasses and was so careless about his clothing that his fellow photographers had to help him dress properly. A few months later, in what, in what is his earliest known interview, Kubrick is said to be so knowledgeable about the camera that the instrument has served him like the genie served Aladdin. From the start, 
Kubik was described as a focused, experienced and self-assured presence. At the same time, a lighter touch was given with a certain absent-mindedness for trivial matters with the, the result of an unkempt attire. As soon as he started moving towards filmmaking, Kubrick contacted people in the New York papers to write about his project. The tone of the resulting articles is similar to that of the Luke profile. For example, the New York Times said he had a determination to make a name for himself in the movie world, but was not an ordinary tyro, thanks to four and a half years spent as a top flight magazine still photographer and two short films ready for distribution. If you think Stanley is nervous about the prospect of starting filming on his first picture, then you're sadly mistaken. Stanley says he has figured out every camera angle. Again, determination, self-confidence and experience. When Fear and Desire, which was financed independently, was acquired for national distribution, Kubrick became a wunderkind and a boy genius. All the articles I have from 1953 combine expertise, he is called a factotum, and a new all-around movie wizard with a casual look. He is described as unconventionally garbed with a mop of unkempt dark hair. But they also introduce a new element, modesty. Unlike most youthful prodigies, Kubrick is quite spoken and graciously modest. He has his snare of self-confidence, but he keeps it to himself. When Pass of Glory opened, modesty had turned into elusiveness. The New York Times found Kubrick a slightly el elusive, seemingly diffident young man who talks little and makes astonishing movies. The same year, an Esquire profile called Kubrick a star and a phenomenon, joked about his constitutional inability to match his clothes and reaffirmed that, while not a, exactly a recluse, he tends to keep to himself. Kubrick's unusual frugality was also addressed in detail. No houses, but furnished rooms. No swimming pools, just a small Mercedes and stacks of books. When Kubrick took the reins of Spartacus, an article mentioned a sureness, an awareness, a guiding perception, often not duplicated in directors twice his age and many times his experience. Kubrick was described as a quiet, uh, but determined young man not easily deterred from his objective. He is polite, he listens, he offers his own point of view, then he goes ahead and shoots it his way. We find a slight shift when a reporter touched on Kubrick's icy aplomb in taking control of the mammoth production and called him indomitable, commenting on his cool demeanor in maintaining the courage of his convictions that has been known to antagonize his collaborators. Another reporter was even more explicit and wrote Kubrick had a reputation for trouble. In any case, in the early 60s, Kubrick's image was fundamentally that of an unusual, demanding, potentially troublesome, but ultimately benign presence within the film industry, an interesting rising filmmaker with a strong personality and a few bizarre but innocuous eccentricities that were the standard mark of a genius. It is with Dr. Strangelove that Kubrick's image altered dramatically. The customary interview with the New York Times called Kubrick an argumentative director who, in his stormy career, has quarreled with practically everybody. The former infant prodige had suddenly metamorphosed into an infant terrible. It is also during the production of these films that we find the word perfectionist attached to Kubrick for the first time. Interestingly, this change happened when Kubrick became his own producer and further expanded his control, presiding over the Columbia Marketing Department, not without opposition. Kubrick's hold on publicity grew stronger with the making of 2001. To promote the film in England, Kubrick commissioned Victor Davis of the Daily Express an exclusive series of articles to coincide with the London premiere. Davis naturally praised Kubrick's technical genius and spot spotlighted his single-mindedness, writing he was a man of, with a grand obsession whose insistence on perfection drove his designers to despair. The series was embellishing the earlier description with a bit of sensationalism, which is always good for a film's opening, but uh, it also added a new myth, perhaps an evolution of Kubrick's tendency to keep to himself that we saw before. Here, Kubrick was called a secretive gifted man who had an abhorrence of publicity. Davis wrote, his workers are sworn to secrecy. His stages are guarded like bullion vaults. Kubrick was an enigma even to his close associates. 
To call this description myths is particularly fitting, not only because Davis wrote total fabrications, we've seen that Kubrick had the very opposite of publicity abhorrence and that his stages were far from sealed, but also because Davis used the very word mythology. After recounting some anecdotes about Kubrick's perfectionism, he wrote, these tales gave rise to a studio mythology. It begins, in six days, God created heaven and earth, and on the seventh day, Stanley Kubrick sent it back for modifications. The last two articles in the series are especially noteworthy. Kubrick was said to have an astonishing capacity for work. He has labored 18 hours a day without a single day off for four years. He appeared to be both permanently on the telephone and ubiquitous, directing actors, setting camera focus, supervising wardrobe and makeup. He has a compulsion to double in everybody's job. When he showed his films to the New York critics, he was constantly in and out of the projection box, adjusting sound level and focus. Earlier, he had insisted on a trial run on the theater of the theater air conditioning. When he arrived in England in 65, Kubrick drew up a plan to have a helicopter bomb the town near his studio with DDT because he was informed that a plague of flies was imminent. And finally, we learned here that Kubrick refuses to fly and that his chauffeur is not permitted to go above 25 miles per hour. It appears we have found the origin of your usual Kubrick anecdotes. With such an outcome, one would assume that Kubrick was crossed with Victor Davis, yet in a following letter, Kubrick was actually very cordial and thanked him dearly. Four years later, Kubrick considered Davis another interview for, for A Clockwork Orange, where the same myths are repeated. I guess we have found not only the origin of the Kubrick mythology, but also its originator, and I don't mean Victor Davis. Kubrick didn't use a single journalist to shape his persona. The text printed in the Clockwork Orange theatrical program was a profile by Alexander Walker where Kubrick was called, and I quote, enigmatic as the monoliths in 2001, and almost as elusive, a hermit keeping the world always at a distance, behind gates encrusted with verboten notices guarding his privacy. Walker wrote, Kubrick is fanatical in preparing his films, even using maps of the incoming flight paths at the nearby airport. It is worth remembering that Walker was not an ordinary writer, but one of the few journalists that Kubrick trusted. He was the author of the first authorized study of Kubrick's films, Stanley Kubrick Directs, which Kubrick obviously amended prior to publication, and even served as a ghostwriter for that letter to the editor that we saw earlier to, uh, sent to defend A Clockwork Orange. Walker, in fact, outdid Victor Davis and continued to foster the Kubrick mythology for the following 30 years. But let's continue with the theater programs. The American one for A Clockwork Orange contained an editorial biography that read, Kubrick's reputation for control is legend. In addition to producing, directing, and adapting A Clockwork Orange, he operated a camera, lit the set, was involved in every decision regarding casting, a direction, scoring, and mixing. Combining the control freak myth and some eccentricities, Barry Lyndon Prescott stated, there is only one boss on a Stanley Kubrick film. That's Stanley Kubrick. A painstaking genius and a self-admitted perfectionist, Kubrick drives his own car because he wouldn't trust the driver. Kubrick works under a heavy cloak of secrecy. He is a unique, retiring, obsessive and unpredictable genius. These profiles that were officially distributed to media outlets are an indication that Kubrick must have seen a positive, exploitable marketing value in such a peculiar image of himself. Indeed, a similar description occurs in the press ma material for The Shining and Full Metal Jacket. And I just want to draw your attention to this bit included in The Shining press kit. Kubrick is famous for his obsessive attention to detail. He will shoot a scene over and over with reports from the set of 87 takes for some scene. And remember, seven years later, Kubrick would complain about the myth of the 100 takes. After 2001, A Space Odyssey, Kubrick's mythological image was pushed persistently into the media circuit at every film opening, cemented and became proverbial. Kubrick successfully established himself as a one-of-a-kind filmmaker, hermetic and hermetic. This is the point of arrival of a strategy that Kubrick put in place as soon as he entered the business. I found out what I believe was his very first move 
a 1950 news story from the Associated Press, a very effective move in actuality because it was syndicated around the United States and reached a readership of millions with boasting headlines such as Kubrick is teaching Hollywood how to produce low-cost films and are you listening Sam Goldwyn? This article shows not only the boldness of the young Kubrick, he was only 22 years old, but also the early signs of a carefully constructed image. Kubrick juxtaposed himself against the Hollywood producers and directors. They had costly set, sets, big offices, swimming pools, hordes of assistants, while he didn't even own a house and his only staff was his wife. The article stated that his obsession was movies. During the shooting of Day of the Fight, he did everything himself, from directing to arranging the lights, stands and reflectors. Kubrick said he was certainly certain sorry, he could do his next film for just $50,000. The answer is carefully planning, he said. We have worked out on paper every scene, every shot. There will be no writers, producers, directors or other directors to contend with. There will be... There will, Sorry, there won't be any time lost in argument or discussion. There will be only one boss, me. Basically, everything I've read so far is contained in this article. It marks the birth of an image that Kubrick nurtured for the subsequent 40 years. He controlled it as much as he controlled his films, shaping and filtering anything that was supposed to go public. Kubrick was the mastermind behind the Kubrick mythology. I'll give you now a few examples to see how Kubrick took action in order to build a useful image. The first, clip, uh, the first is a clip in which director Norma Lloyd recalls when, in 1952, he sent Kubrick to Kentucky to do some second unit work for his film, Mr. Lincoln, and Kubrick didn't miss the opportunity to speak with the local press. The actors would send back clipping from the newspapers down there where he was describing to, uh, how he was doing the series, I found it very amusing because the indication was that he was making the picture. And as I said to someone, with an ego like this, nothing will ever stop him. I, it didn't even matter what the quality of the work was going to be, which indeed turned out well. But I'm... He just... Um, he just said it was his picture. You also might remember Kubrick contradicting his collaborator's statements in order to become the sole responsible for every single idea that was in his films, something that of course caused more than some friction. I'll just mention the feud with Douglas Trumbull for the special effects of 2001. As explained by Roger Karras, who worked as a director of publicity for Dr. Strangelove in 2001, Stanley will deny anything, no matter what, he will deny anything he thinks will reflect less than sensationally on the mythic Kubrick. But the most extreme example of Kubrick manipulating his own image, I think, is given by Gordon Stainford regarding the editing of the documentary The Making of the Shining. There were two sequences of Stanley uh, the, uh, two sequences of Stanley that showed him in a rather warm light and not in that kind of aggressive light that has been rumored about. In our cut, he was very warm and nice, and he wanted those scenes cut out, and what was left were the sequences of him shouting at Shelley Duval in the snow. It was almost as if he wanted that side of him to be shown and not the side where he was very gentle and nice to his actors. I spoke with Jay Cox, who met Kubrick in 1968 to write a profile for Time magazine, and he was also the author of that article where Kubrick dismissed the myths as your usual Kubrick anecdotes. In those years, Cox became friendly with Kubrick, and it's interesting to see how a text written by a friend and not by a journalist still repeats the mythology and asserts that all the stories are true. Cox said to me, I was always very amused by this, at this mad genius stuff. And I can tell you for a fact, Stanley thought it was pretty funny too, but he was aware of the publicity advantage of it. He constructed a mysterious persona of himself. There was nothing mysterious about him. He was just a wonderful, funny guy and a great companion. We've been appreciating Kubrick as a wonderful, funny guy in recent years, thanks to the new memoirs by his collaborators, but such a positive image was definitely not encouraged while he was alive. As Cox suggested, the construction of a controversial sorry, the construction of a controversial image was done 
to the benefit of the filmmaker. Being a perfectionist, obsessive, reclusive and eccentric genius helped, him, helped Kubrick find and keep a place in the industry. These are all positive or captivatingly negative qualities, especially in the film business. The Kubrick mythology tapped into, the, into what David Thompson called a character type much beloved in Hollywood, the paranoid megalomaniac. Kubrick's mystique was useful for his work to hire actors, to secure collaborators, to keep his independence and to turn his films into great occasions. And of course, to be talked about in the trade press and by the general audience. Kubrick was very clever in understanding how the media works. He knew what excites people and shrewdly exploited it. By talking with many people who worked with Kubrick, I got the impression that he was a very fascinating man with a magnetic personality, a driving force who operated by persuasion, admiration and affection. But it is known that in the formal context of an interview, or especially in public occasions, he turned very shy and his mind went often blank. I'd like to play a short clip of Kubrick as the New York premiere of 2001, when we can clearly see how uncomfortable he was in front, in front of a camera. Het is een van de zeldzame keren dat Kubrick zich nog in het openbaar laat zien. Uh, we started in 1965, early 1965. Well, I became interested in the idea that the universe uh, was full of intelligent civilizations, which is the current scientific belief. Well, the facts in the film only help you believe the story, but uh, the, uh, the scientists know now that there are about a hundred billion stars in our galaxy and about a hundred billion galaxies in the visible universe. The point is that there are so many stars in the universe that the likelihood of life evolving around them, even if there were possibilities of one in a million, there would be hundreds of millions of worlds in the universe. In a particularly stressful situation, Kubrick rapidly lost his train of thought in his train of thought and pulled back to statistics, which of all the things he could have said about 2001 were certainly not the most appealing. It was not a very good PR job. Uh, Paul Joyce, the director of The Invisible Man, told me on a news beat from the interview he did with production designer Ken Adam. I remember Ken Adam telling me uh, about the, the premiere of Strange Love, which he drove Stanley to. Kubrick was vomiting with with fear and and dread at exposing himself. Wow. So there was a genuine yeah. physical and yeah. mental problem yeah. of of uh, of being exposed in a situation that he was not in control of. As a result, uh, sorry, as a solution of his inability to be jaunty on social occasions, Kubrick fabricated a series of fictional persona for himself. In the 50, 50s, he was the Wunderkind, a precocious, authoritative filmmaker, slightly elusive with a bohemian look. In the early 60s, he presented himself as the Maverick, an icy cold, argumentative director, single mindedly focused on his work. Gradually, as he gained power and, ind and independence, he evolved into an obsessive, uncompromising master, an all controlling, all knowing genius, the perfectionist. From the 70s, while spreading a number of eccentricities around, he refined his image and became a secretive, mysterious figure, a retiring artist, the Hermit. His mission was then accomplished, accomplished. no one would ever bother him again. Very cleverly, Paul Joyce told me, Kubrick made himself invisible. And by making himself invisible, everybody wanted to see him. It's like the Invisible Man, where is he? You want to see him, don't you? The way to increase a mystery is not talk about it. The only persona Kubrick didn't create was the lunatic, which can be seen basically as a degenerate version of the others that emerged in the 90s. Kubrick was portrayed as crazy, mindless, finicky, paranoid, phobic, dangerous, and so on. These characterizations were neither created nor nurtured by him. On the contrary, Kubrick tried to fight them whenever possible. For example, when Ken Adam gave interviews to the press after Barry Lyndon, which he only did because Kubrick wouldn't face the reporters, he used the P-word, that is paranoid, and Stanley said he shouldn't have, but he was the P-word. This again speaks volumes for Kubrick's control of his image. He carefully encouraged the good, productive myths and stopped the bad, damaging ones. 
This is why he sued Punch magazine or consulted with the police about the Alan Conway affair. I'm going to conclude now and try to answer one remaining question. The fabrication of a mythology is rather common with film directors. When it succeeds, it makes them recognizable in the eyes of an audience that has always, uh, that has always been more interested in actors. And consequently, it helps them get more power in a fiercely competitive industry. Thanks to a well-crafted mythology, a director can become a household name, his films can be seen as, as a part of an oeuvre, thus deserving repeated viewings, careful appraisal by film critics and academic studies. A director may even achieve a cult status. For example, we know Alfred Hitchcock as a morbidly ironic, jovial man, an image that clearly helped him sell his films. Or we can remember Federico Fellini, who never missed an opportunity to expose how great a liar he was inventing the most outrageous stories about himself, a process that effectively, effectively turned him into a Fellinian character. And most recently, the sarcastic and sometimes plain shocking exploits of Lars von Trier mirror his abrasive films. So Kubrick was not, no exception, and if you think about it, this mythological image was a perfect companion to his cinema. What set Kubrick apart is that he pretended he had nothing to do with his image, and then he even was irritated by it. From the 70s, he repeatedly complained about this mythology, while at the same time providing the very same stories to media outlets through authorized press kits and the help of assisting journalists. This, to my knowledge, is unheard of. I cannot think of any other director, or actually anyone, in fact, who expressed this content with the fictional persona he or she contributed to create. Kubrick acted like a magician who tries to hide the hand that's doing the trick. Or, in fact, he acted like Dr. Mabuse, who operated through a network of willing and unaware agents and managed to hypnotize everybody. I think we can find an answer for Kubrick's disguise in what he said about the value of mystery in cinema. I believe movies have lost a lot of their romance and glamour through the present day custom of having stars open up their private lives. I have a nostalgia for the days before my time when Hollywood was a mysterious exciting place where every star was a fabulous person. They didn't tell all about themselves. They encouraged rumors but they never divulged facts and their personal appearances were great occasions. I like stars to have a mystery. Kubrick was speaking about the reason why Sue Lyon was kept secret during the making of Lolita, or as he repeatedly phrased it, clouded in absolute mystery. But I don't think it's a stretch if we applied, if, if we applied this attitude to Kubrick's own persona. Apart from the unwanted, bitter turn of events of the 90s, I believe Kubrick successfully created a mythological image for himself that helped him be perceived as a powerful, distinct director with a quirky personality that was guaranteed to attract media coverage. He did so by not telling all about himself, by encouraging rumors, by never divulging facts, in short, by becoming himself a star clouded in absolute mystery. Thank you very much for your attention. Thank you very, very much, Filippo, for folding out all these wonderful materials for us and for this brilliant analysis and your thoughts. I guess there are some questions or comments following your talk about Kubrick's mythological image. Are there any right at the start? Okay. <laughs> Peter. Thanks ever so much. I mean, when I first read the one of the versions of this paper, I was really blown away because I thought uh, this really changes everything. Now I've had some time to think about it, and I would suggest that maybe the the eighties and nineties, which is the period we're all getting increasingly less patience with you know to just accept well he just made fewer films what about it uh it seems to me that you, similar to james's analysis of uh kubrick's striving for independence which in a sense collapses in on itself once he gets it uh is there something similar going on you know with what you're analyzing is, is there a sort of fatal logic at work uh, that what happens in the 90s 
is actually really just a consequence of him achieving exactly what he wanted by the 80s. Uh, so that I, I don't know. I, I'm getting more this of a is, sense of yeah. tragedy here. Yeah, yeah. But maybe I'm just you know going back to some other model of how to understand an artist's career. But but it seems to me there's something quite tragic in the way things turn. You know, the combination of yeah. lack of output, the actual withdrawal from engagement with the press, uh, and then this this quite dramatic backlash or, or this this filling the vacuum uh, which really builds on what he's been building up for decades exactly. before there seems to be something quite tragic about it and it's certainly not a case that he started complaining about the mythology in uh, 1987 after seven years that he didn't do uh, anything from a point of view of uh, artistic artistic outcome and in fact uh, meeting the reporters he sort of joked about the mythology, but he said that he was uh, that it bothered him, that it was a problem, and perhaps it was uh, another painfully ironic outcome, uh, a bit less damaging and uh, weird than Alan Conway. But certainly, uh, we can say that Kubrick paved his way to this outcome. I mean, if you if you played uh, with the uh, with the media for uh, such a long time, you portray yourself as an all-controlling, all-knowing genius, and then you retire. The media attention perhaps wants something back from you because you create a void. And um, perhaps this void was filled uh, uh, increasingly, because now we are all increasingly obsessed by celebrity, It this void was filled with uh, invented stories and with uh, mal malice from the reporters because they couldn't uh, interview Kubrick and so uh, why so he was ac accessible before why not now and so they perhaps took revenge this can all be hypothesis but it is true that uh, the backlash happened and the Kubrick's uh, the, the Kubrick family they, they are still dealing with it so it's uh, something that we all are dealing with. Uh, as I said, uh, if you are even casually talking about Kubrick with someone, the first thing that he said or she said is, uh, you know, he was a crazy director, wasn't he? So. Here's another question or comment. Um, well, it's just something that comes to my mind. I don't know about the concept of humor. I mean, his humor, humor being misunderstood, humor being, I don't know, it just comes up talking about this right now because that's not something we've talked about. Mm -hmm. Can you say maybe something to that? Well, the, his humor definitely come up in his interviews. And we have a few examples of uh, uh, interviews recorded on tape. Well, uh, where he is very uh, communicative, ironic, and the, he and the reporters were having a good time by talking. So this uh, was clearly uh, an aspect of his uh, personality, but it didn't transpire in the general press because uh, in the interviews where the text was uh, transcribed and edited, most of the more uh, funny things were cut out and uh, so you have this image of a very serious filmmaker, which clearly helps uh, selling his films, as we said with Hitchcock or Fellini. So it's an image that is uh, consistent with the kind of uh, very authoritative kind of filmmaking that Kubrick is doing. But it's a partial view of his personality. And when I read uh, um, Catherine's uh, comment on, online, where, he, where she gets uh, upset by how people still think about, uh, still uh, repeat things about Kubrick's craziness, I do understand that she's upset because she knew the whole package, so to speak. And she sees that something important is missing in the. Uh, image in the portray that the press uh, did about Kubrick. So thank you very much for this enlightening talk. 
I would be interested in what happened around Clockwork Orange, because in regard to all this media manipulation, as far as I remember, he withdrew the film in England yeah. in the 70s, because there was all this media buzz about the film inspiring violence and so on. And uh, as far as I can remember, he uh, withdrew it, that it shouldn't be shown in England anymore. So was this a kind of media manipulation that backfired, or how does this fit into this idea of playing with the media? Well, in this case, it was uh, a very practical decision he had to take because the family were receiving uh, death threats, and the matter was really, really serious. And Christiana had addressed this uh, in uh, several of th those interviews that I refer uh, reference to. And also Emilio D'Alessandro told me about uh, ticking packages being delivered at the post office, uh, you know, for making a play about the clockwork orange, but a ticking package could contain a bomb, not only a clockwork orange, and not necessarily a clockwork orange. So it was a very uh, tough time for the Kubrick family, and they were. it, it, it also coincide, coincided with uh, the um, threat that Kubrick received by the IRA when they were shooting Barry Lyndon in Ireland. So these two events basically happened at the same time. So Kubrick, uh, I think, felt a uh, concrete, um, a, a, an actual threat to his family, and he decided to uh, continue to shoot Barry Lyndon in England and not here at Ireland. He scrapped his production plan and to retire, uh, to withdraw um, Clockwork Orange from the uh, English uh, theatres. And uh, I think that when this happened, it was 1974, and Kubrick was already, I think, playing the card of the, her the hermit. Because uh, it was after three years that uh, uh, Clockwork Orange was released, he was shooting Berlindon, and Berlindon was the first production where uh, the Warner Brothers allegedly were not allowed to go on set. So it was the first film that Kubrick did in absolute secrecy. So perhaps, not consciously, not voluntarily, but the fact that he withdrew Clockwork Orange. Or, uh, well, it's not even true that he withdrew it. it just play, the film just played out, and after 74, uh, it, didn't, uh, it, it wasn't redistributed. There was nothing public to be said. People just discovered years, years later that Clockwork Orange could not be screened in uh, England because there was a, um, uh, a film event at the uh, British Film Institute and Clockwork Orange could not be pr screened. So this is how the, the general public discovered that Clockwork Orange was withdrawn, withdrawn, but it was not something that was published or uh, promoted or made public. Thanks, Filippo. Um, a few days ago, I uh, discussed with a feminist colleague of mine at the university, and when I told her that I work on Stanley Kubrick, she said something like, oh, so you're not sympathetic with the cause of women, then. Uh, <laughs> so I was wondering whether you could tell me something about uh, this misogynistic image of uh, Kubrick. When did it occur? Do you know if it's something that escaped his control, perhaps from A Clockwork Orange or even Lolita? Well, actually, the word misogynistic don't appear, as far as I know, in the articles that are about Kubrick. It appears in critical essays or critical evaluations of his films or in the reviews of A Clockwork Orange, especially. So I don't know if it's uh, something that happened because of the critics, because of some interpretation, because of some odd topic for the moment, at the moment. And uh, he certainly didn't say anything misogynistic, although in some of his interviews in the 50s, I could describe him not really as a supporter of women's lib. He later became a supporter of women's lib, and uh, some of his 1950s interviews, he said things that nowadays we could cringe if we read them. So, um, yeah, uh, I, I don't know if you, I mean, I, I certainly wouldn't believe he was misogynistic. I mean, as Christiana said, he was surrounded by women and not only in his family, but also in his films. I mean, uh, his collaboration with Milena Canonero for the costumes 
or we uh, we enjoyed the recollections by jo Joy Cuff at the uh, Bangor conference in 2000 and, about 2001, where she was uh, a very young artist and one of the few female uh, person in uh, in the uh, production machine of 2001, and he had a great time. And Kubrick actually, uh, even M Marisa Berenson said that during Barry Lyndon she was treated with the utmost respect. So if Kubrick sometimes was bullying or was pushy with some members of his crew, they were definitely not female members of the crew. Uh, maybe one uh, comment for the last part, for the crazy and lunatic one. Um, maybe we like to think about him that way because he must be crazy, he must be lunatic because his films are so good. So there is Martin Scorsese, he is good, Spielberg is good, and his, their films are also good, but Kubrick, they are exceptional, so he must be crazy. That's why maybe it is so um, so vital, so fruitful, this uh, mythology. And it's also a concept that can be very easily... Um You can very easily shift from being a very authoritative filmmaker, being a very controlling, a control freak, a crazy person. So it, it's very easy to shift a little bit towards the uh, crazy part of the spectrum. And uh, perhaps sometimes a, a journalist wrote he was crazy, meaning not clinically crazy, but just very eccentric. Or, or was a way to address the, uh, address a particular uh, weird moment during a production of the film, and then he was repeated and distorted. I mean, all these theories are, I think, valid because we cannot find one single explanation for something that is as broad as the image of someone so uh, known as Stanley Kubrick. But this is certainly. Uh, one of the uh, possibility that uh, we can think he's crazy because he certainly was not one um, like any of us. He was exceptional and uh, yeah, so he must be crazy. He must be out there. He must be some someone special. I don't know. Just, just a, a little thing um, to add in, in terms of um, the, the question about uh, Kubrick um, being um, misogynist. Is it the word in English? Okay. Um, perhaps the perception of, of him being uh, this way, uh, the girl uh, that uh, made this comment to, to you, um, is legitimized by the fact that Kubrick himself recognized um, in an interview that I'm having you to place in time, um, that he was not very good in writing um, female roles. He said he says something like that. I think it was around uh, the 60s or the 70s. He says, uh, perhaps, I don't know why, but I can't seem to be uh, mm -hmm. that, that good yeah. in, 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 in portraying women. In, yeah, I think he in said mo that he was sorry that he couldn't write ap apart from it for his wife because he would have liked to that was one, another the one, experience yeah. of Pass of Glory where Christiana famously ends the film with a, that lyrical note. Yes, that was an, another one. Yeah, I remember that one. In another one, he's answering to someone. He says, yeah, I, I don't know why I can't, I can't seem to be able to. So perhaps this <laughs> inability, and I let the, the audience judge if that's true, to, if that's true or not. I, I'm not uh, in position to answer. Probably he's, he's right or he has some, some reason to be right. But probably this perception comes across the audience as well. Um, uh, we obviously remember many um, male actors uh, or male roles from his movies, uh, of course, Jack and Jack Nicholson and even even Tom Cruise and, and Nicole Kidman. Tom Cruise is the, the uh, obviously the protagonist. And of course, uh, he's following the book where uh, the, the main character is, is the male. But yeah, I, well, I, don't know. I would say, I would also say that the character of Alice Harford, played by Nicole Kidman, is a much more rounded character than Albertina in the, uh, or at least as good as Albertina in uh, the Schnitzler's uh, novella. And uh, um, perhaps you know that uh, a, a new, uh, supposedly lost screenplay by Kubrick has been recently rediscovered by Nathan Abrams and it's the adaptation of the um, Stefan Zweig's uh, The Burning Secret 
And Nathan told me that the uh, the adaptation that Kubrick did with Calder Willingham, he expanded a lot the female part. In the original novella by Zweig, the um, the uh, the mother is not even addressed by name. It's just called the mother because the point of view is from uh, the son. In the Kubrick adaptation, uh, the female part uh, is more elaborate. There is a new scene where she telephoned her husband at home. So we have a different point of view and the uh, female part was enlarged and expanded. So Kubrick perhaps was not as bad as he thought about writing females part. I mean, I, I haven't read the uh, Burning Secret adaptation, but in Eyes Wide Shut, Alice Harford, I think it's the driving character. It's, it's, all, it's of course in the original novella, because it's the spark that sets uh, the male character into his uh, odyssey. But in the film, she is the one that, res that comes out more uh, vivid, more active, more conscious, more uh, knowledgeable about the marriage. <coughs> this is part of the story, of, of course, but it's still something that can uh, point us to the direction of saying that Kubrick or his collaborators, Frederick Raphael in this case, were able to portray women in a challenging and interesting and intelligent way. Well, thank you again so much, uh, Filippo. Um, um, just one last question, and then we have a couple of minutes to, to talk about your book. Um, if there aren't any other comments, questions from the audience, of course. Uh, but also Filippo will stay uh, for uh, the symposium weekend, also for tomorrow. So if there are any, just uh, feel free to, to join us again between the panels. Um, so I was wondering, just in terms of uh, your practical approach, what was your starting point? You've screened us this, this opening of um, A Life in Pictures, the Jan Harlan film, the documentary. Uh, was there such a starting point and how did you proceed? So um, it looks very impressive what you came up with from the archives. You must have spent many, many hours, months well, actually, at the archives. Many, many hours. Uh looking into newspapers database because it's about Kubrick's image so it needs to be published publicly and in the archive for this presentation just the letter that he, Kubrick wrote to Victor Davis where I was surprised to read that he was pleased uh, and he said that uh, a, a few of the anecdotes were not true but then the same anecdotes were repeated in the Clockwork Orange uh, article that, so again I wondered was Kubrick playing with Victor Davis again, or maybe Victor Davis didn't took, didn't take anything, uh, did, did take something incorrectly, and then he repeated it. I don't know, but the effect is, uh, is uh, what, we, what we know. Uh, my approach was to uh, just uh, read the material, and then I sensed that there was something strange, because um, we know that Kubrick complained. I mean, I mean, I read the interviews and I knew that Kubrick complained about his image. So why in the uh, press book for Barry Lyndon there were words like legendary, perfectionist, obsessive, which is a word that he used in the 50s, but later he complained about it. So I found something that was not, that, was, that wouldn't match. So I wanted to find a reason why. Uh, either he changed his mind or, and this is the theory that I came up with, trying to fit all the pieces together. So now changing the subject to your your book uh, that you co-wrote with Emilio D'Alessandro, just maybe you can tell us in a nutshell, how did you first came across Emilio? Out of sheer luck, because I had, I still have a website about Kubrick in Italian and uh, it is one of the very first uh, website that, come up, that comes up in uh, Google web search. So a friend of Emilio who knew that Emilio wanted to tell his stories about his life with Stanley Kubrick happened to see my website, thought that I could be uh, the good, a good person to, uh, to be involved with this project. So I got called uh, uh, by this person and uh, I met Emilio and I interviewed him 
for uh, two years. Then I wrote the first draft. And then I rewrote it, rewrote it, and rewrote it because it was my first book. And I actually wasn't really that sure that I was able to turn 30 years of life into a cohesive narrative. Because another thing that I wanted to do was not to write an essay about Kubrick by picking up things from Emilio's experience. I wanted to tell his stories because it's a fascinating story. He uh, went into England to try and find a job. He wanted to be a racing car driver. He had no knowledge about filmmaking. He never saw any Kubrick's film. Uh, he never even heard the name Stanley Kubrick, and he, for him it was just another job. And uh, it, he discovered this man, and he liked it. He liked him. And then they gradually evolved into a friendship, I would say. And when you read your book, you discover or explore that um, he was much more than a driver to him. Yeah, he started as the driver, and then as... Uh, It happened all the time with all the other Kubrick collaborators. And this uh, Milena Canonero told me that she was contacted by Kubrick for uh, a Clockwork Orange, but she wasn't a, a costume designer. And when Kubrick offered her the role for, of costume designer for Barry Lyndon, she was terrified because she said, I can't do it, I'm not a costume designer. And Kubrick was uh, slowly persuading her Like, but you have a great taste. We can do it. Don't worry. We can do it. And then she became the, the costume designer for Barry Lyndon together with Ulla Britt Sutherland. And this is, hap this is what, happens, what happened with Emilio as well. He started as a driver and then he went on to took his daughters, took Kubrick's daughter to schools because Kubrick wouldn't trust any other driver. And then uh, take Christiana to art uh, um, exhibitions and then dealing with Warner Brothers and then please mend my f refrigerator and then uh, let's uh, renovate the stable blocks and we need a carpenter you can do it and uh, luckily or not luckily at all for Emilio he was able to do these jobs and so he never escaped for 30 years and he basically didn't have a personal life that's It's the outcome <laughs> it's a highly successful uh, book, if I remember correctly. It's the fifth edition now? In Italy. In Italy? Fifth edi fifth, five editions. And there's also some international editions. Yes, the uh, English one and uh, the Chinese one, which was published last October. And I've recently been told that the, back, the book was sold in Russia. So hopefully next year we will have a Russian edition. Unfortunately, not a German one. I don't know why. Don't ask me, and not a French one. And I thought that it was uh, Kubrick was uh, a, an interesting director for the French audience, but we discussed it with Vincent, and I don't have any idea. Vincent doesn't have any idea. I don't know. Maybe if there's a publisher <laughs> listening to uh, me right now, the book is available, and uh, I mean, in Spain as well, Spanish language, no South, no South America, so. Hopefully. So maybe there's somebody listening and watching yeah. us on the YouTube channel. That's it. Uh, like all the other talks, also this will be um, on YouTube, available on the YouTube channel of Deutsches Film Museum soon. Thank you so much again, yeah. Filippo, for your Thank wonderful you. contribution. Thank you. Thank you. And I just wanted to mention to you again, we have some hard copies of the international edition, which was published two years ago by Arcade, um, just upstairs at the museum's shop. And Filippo is willing to sign uh, if you want to take your personal copy at home tonight. We will meet again soon, right here in the cinema for the screening of Brian Cook's Calamie Kubrick. See you soon and thank you again. <laughs>